here tonight. We have maybe less than a, a long agenda, but it is nevertheless just as important as all of us. And we'll go ahead and call our special call meeting order at 16 or 1830 hours. And uh, item number two is to conduct a public hearing to consider testimony on an ordinance amending the zoning ordinance, subdivision regulation ordinance, and building codes to call said ordinances to be in compliance with House Bill 2439, House Bill 3167, and House Bill 2497, which bills take effect on September 1st, 2019. I've got a brief presentation if you'd like to hear it before public comment. Um, as the mayor just mentioned, there are three house bills that are um, significant changes for cities. They were signed by the governor back in mid-June. They do go into effect on September 1st. Um, unfortunately, for pretty much every community across the state, that time frame did not allow sufficient time for the public notices and public hearings required in order to amend zoning ordinances and um, other text amendments that you would need to comply with these bills to be adequately done. So we have drafted um, the ordinances before you tonight which basically say to the extent you have an ordinance that conflicts with the new state law requirements you won't enforce it and that you the city will follow the new state laws and then that will give you time to do any text amendments that you may desire to do I can tell you there are a number of legislatures who voted for these bills that are now saying they didn't understand what the effect of them was, and I don't know if it's just wishful thinking or a real possibility that some of this might get repealed or changed somewhat in the next session, which won't be until 2021, and so a lot of communities are saying we're just going to kind of use these band-aid ordinances because it is very expensive to do a review of every building code, the zoning ordinance and the subdivision regulation ordinance and rewrite them in hopes that um, other less work will be needed in two years and or that they can uh, work in their budgets over the next couple of years, the, the funds to actually do that if it still needs to be done. Uh, House Bill 2439 is known as the Building Materials Bill. Um, it basically states that cities cannot regulate the materials that are used in construction. That's exterior and interior. Um, it applies to residential structures and to commercial structures. It doesn't apply to industrial structures, but uh, most industrial structures aren't masonry or <laughs> other products anyway because they're industrial. Um, it's whether other new, brand new construction or if you have remodels or infill development, it applies to all of those equally. Um, Many cities have local amendments to the International Building Code, such as the Residential Code, the Property Maintenance Code, the Fire Code, the Plumbing Code, etc. They're all standard codes, and the state even dic dictates some particular ones of those that cities are required to adopt. But the North Texas uh, Council of Governments always has local amendments that they recommend because as you can imagine in different parts of the country the soil conditions and the weather and the climate uh, are different and what works best for construction in one part of the country might be different so um, historically local amendments have been done um, those generally won't be enforceable anymore um, there are exceptions to the general rule that you cannot regulate building materials. Um, to give you an example of how the general rule would apply, 
Uh, your zoning ordinance in single family zoning does have minimum masonry requirements uh, for home construction. If the, so even though that's in your zoning ordinance, you can no longer enforce that requirement. Um, another example, I, I don't know particularly if this is in your fire code, but um, a lot of municipalities in the area require um, class A electrical wiring in new construction, and I'm not familiar with the technical aspects of wiring, but apparently there are lower classes of wiring that a lot of fire marshals think are not as safe um, as the class A. You could no longer have a local amendment requiring the safer Class A wiring to be used. Um, and so that's, that's generally how it works. Now, there are exceptions to the general rule, uh, as with most rules. If you have um, a designated historic district, it has to be a state or federal designation, then you can enforce building material standards. Those are a lot of times going to be architectural, um, you know, something to keep the historic nature of the structure. Um, if you have, if you had an overlay district with heightened standards that was adopted before April 1st of this year, and that overlay district was adopted because the base zoning wasn't sufficient because it was important architecturally, culturally, or historically to have different standards in that area. You can still impose that. Um, the same rule would apply to plan developments that were adopted before April 1st. Uh, if you have a designated main street under the state program, you can still um, enforce building material regulations. So there are a few exceptions, but not a lot. These are just examples of um, what the uniform building codes allow. The, for the left side is residential, the right side is non-residential as exterior wall covering. Um, you can see under the residential, like the fourth one down is particle board panels. I don't even know what that is. I don't know if um, Councilmember Thomas might know more um, what that is. Aluminum, vinyl siding, um, and brick is still allowed, but the property owner has to choose to use it. Um, and the left is just an example of things that the building codes allow uh, for the walls. Okay, next. The, these are um, the same type of examples, except this would be for the roofs instead of for the walls on the exterior. Um, they allow uh, lots of different products, including metal, clay, asphalt, wood shingles, um, etc. And then, of course, there are even more choices for non residential, including um, vegetative roofs. And we've got, I think the next slides are a few photos. Here's, so here's um, an e example of metal siding with metal roof versus brick exterior with a shingle roof. Next one. Um, same thing. Next, um, so there's absolutely nothing we can do to keep the three little pig construction companies from coming into town, set up a straw house or Hobbin, Hobbin Cottage or something. Correct. Unless there, or if you do, if you have a contractual arrangement with a property owner, um, those can still be enforced. An example would be the Manchway Rislin development. That agreement from 2008 does have masonry standards in it. And so since that's a contractual obligation, as long as that agreement is in effect, that can still be enforced, but it can't be enforced through the zoning ordinance. It, it so has to be prior to April 1st? The contracts do not. A property owner could voluntarily burden their property if they wanted to. And another thing to point out is if someone lives in a homeowner's association 
and their um, covenants and deed restrictions of the HOA require certain exterior materials such as masonry, the HOA can still enforce the private deed restrictions. This law does not affect them. It only affects the city. But when it comes to masonry requirements, even under contractual, it wouldn't just fall under brick masonry or block masonry or stone masonry. It could fall under the hardy board and the city of Texas products. Potentially, if the contract just said masonry, but if it defined masonry, then it would be however the contract defines it or lists the permissible materials. Um, here's just an example of a um, metal multifamily building. Next. Um, this is what commercial structures could look like now. They don't even have to have that minimum, minimal stone that this one happens to have. Um, this this bill was sold a couple of ways to the legislatures. One was that it would make housing more affordable um, if cities didn't have the ability to enforce standards. And the, the concern with that is that might be true up front, but over the long term, it's probably going to cost more to take care of and maintain the home and your utilities may be more, et cetera, with lower quality interior materials being used. So it may be a little bit cheaper to get into the home over the long term. It may not be less expensive. Um, next slide. One, one of the other things that I, that I don't know is the cost to insure some of these things. I don't know, and or to be able to get a mortgage. I mean, if you have a particle board siding house with, you know, a vegetative roof, is someone going to lend you money to buy that? Um, or is an insurance company going to be willing to sell you a homeowner's policy? Or if they are, is the policy unaffordable? So there's a lot of real world problems that might keep this in check a little bit, but um, we'll just have to see how that plays out over time. Here's an example of <laughs> vegetative roofing, which, I mean, I, I'm not commenting on the looks of any of these, just, you know, your ability to decide as a community what's appropriate in your community is um, now gone. <laughs> oh my gosh. So there are there are some things that can still be done that relate to architecture as long as you're not regulating the material that they have to use. You could still require a certain architectural style, like you could say something has to be Victorian. Uh, you could require certain color schemes. You can require a minimum roof pitch. Um, you could require a J swing garage. You know there. Are, you could require that potentially that you know two different materials have to be used to try to create architectural interest. You just can't say which two. Um, so there still are some architectural controls that you can have from a design perspective. You just can't tell them uh, what materials they have to use to build that J-swing garage or what materials they have to use to build that 6 to 12 pitch roof. Any questions? Is there a, so a developer is coming in and wanting to rezone for residential uh, certain area because let's come in and put a hundred and some odd houses up and we know that that developer is now like in line with building cheap houses if you want to say that because that's kind of what my mind is. I mean we we don't have to approve that zoning on that like we can tell that person like no right? That's we can correct. still do that because we don't like the way you're building your deal almost like hint hint, like come back and show us that you're going to build houses this way and then we'll actually approve the zoning. So I mean, is that still... 
That that is true. You you it is always within your legislative discretion whether to approve a zoning change request or not. If, See, if it, but if, if it's already zoned, it's all right to be zoned. Yeah, we're gonna have a public comment right. anyway. Not, not, I'm asking have specific questions for you anyway. Just hold that and let her finish and then. Okay. Rip, rip. And then last thing is the, the, the Texas legislation, do they create a floor for any of this? I know like they took kind of setting the bar for the cities out, like they took that out, but did they like create a floor outside of just what those materials were up there? Or they're like, hey, you can't like put the cheapest wiring in so your house is gonna burn up at the first part. I mean like did they did they set anything? The the yes, the floor is if so every few years, the national code writers will put out a new version of the code. If something is allowed in any of the last three versions that were published, then it can be used. If, if it's not allowed in any of those three versions, then you can prohibit it. Very basic wiring and plumbing and yeah. those kinds of guidelines. And just as another example, like the city, and this got used against cities um, in the legislative hearings, but the city of Lubbock a few years back put in their local amendments to their fire codes that I think it was called CCST or is it CSST, Lee? Do you know? The, it's a type of gas pipe that it could not be used in Lubbock anymore. Like they named the brand. The reason they did that was that brand had been shown and it had happened in their community and someone had died. It had been shown to attract lightning. Well, what do you think happens when lightning strikes a gas pipe? A fire and or an explosion. And so they just said, this product is too dangerous. It attracts lightning. You can't use it here. I'm not aware of any other cities that outright banned that product, but a lot of other cities did say, if you're using that brand, then you have to have electrical grounding to ground any lightning strikes in order to prevent the fire or explosion. Can't do that anymore. Builder can value that product. They don't ever see kind of renderings. They don't see instructions. Well, we're going to talk about the idea of the body. Maybe you want to put a step in the process. Like you said, everything has to be hot pink or else it's not going to be hot pink. Before we approve it, what is it that they're going to do? Yeah. How do you do it? Well, I think the question that Councilmember Neal asked, you can deny zoning if, and if they come back and say, hey, you know, here's, you know, pretty PowerPoint with renderings of what we're going to build and you approve their zoning, you can't enforce it, even though they said that's what they're going to do. So in that scenario, there would have to be some consideration given on the part of the city in order to enter into a contract where they contractually agree to build the renderings that they're showing you and or to put deed restrictions on their property that require those renderings That's what I'm going to ask. Can we, can we do it contractually then? Say, hey, this is what you're planning. Do we, just, do we need to start? Uh, if I may, that, the example that she just called out is happening today. Planning and zoning approved a strip center along Highway 75 that's anchored by Domino's with a masonry requirement. They came before council, there was considerable discussion. I remember Alderman Neal bringing it up that how much of it is masonry. We had that discussion, he agreed to it. Now it's not enforceable. He has no intention of putting brick on that building. So I'm meeting with them this week to try and negotiate some way to get that building up to our the standard that he agreed to. Uh, I, I feel like in this interim between now and 2021 we're going to need to make a few considerations and concessions to keep our at least our corridor through 75 is attractive as we possibly can. 
In regards to subdivisions, when they do a home development, a PD, right? Instead of entering into a contract, you could make you could make a home, you could make them the HOA. The HOA is your yeah, biggest the, tool. The HOA, you can make your HOA and your covenant and deeds as part of the B and D to go through the PNZ and get your approval for the for the zoning. And what it does is it takes more it takes your code it takes your code enforcement away from the city, which is potential income stream, and puts it back on the HOA, which I'm sure everybody loves. You know. <laughs> Because I love our HOA, okay. <laughs> Doesn't the builder um, do the bylaws initially on an HOA anyway? Uh, the developer does. Not the, not, not, it's not the builder, the, the developer does. Just do the skirt around yeah. and could be in trouble for that. Because if we're well, not really could, making the builder to redo it into a contract, but we're making the HOA do it. So it's still going to be. Well, you, you could, in theory, deny their zoning request to be able to build the houses until an HOA with deed restrictions is in place. Um, the key with that is you have to see what the mechanism is to be able to amend those deed restrictions um, to be sure they can't just one, switch it one back of the other approaches, after you grant the zoning. One of the other approaches that I'm taking is um, in planning and zoning, we've discussed this a couple of times, is developing an incentive program that if they meet this level, there's this offer that comes with that, and then move that up. So if we end up at whatever that percentage of masonry is that we're willing to accept, that you know that would be the highest level of incentive. So they can kind of pick from their shopping list. Here's nothing. Here's something, etc. To help and sent them to to get us through this time. You're talking about like impact fees and developer fees and things of that nature? Yes. Some build, cities build, are build it however you want to. This is how much it is. If you put twenty five percent masonry, yes. It drops twenty five percent if you do it this, it drops it. That's correct. Some what cities those things are, are yet have yet to be determined, but correct. in theory it's I'm sorry. Oh no, just some examples of some cities are increasing their setback requirements or increasing their screening or landscaping requirements. And with the guise of if you're gonna build uh, low quality stuff and we want it farther away from the street, we don't want it to be as visible with more landscaping and screening. And so as an incentive to do masonry or even hardy plank or whatever you would want to incentivize yeah. um, then the property owner could get reduced setback or reduced landscaping requirements for complying with building materials. Or in this case, you know, we're evaluating the impact of these in our city. So we have, you know, by maxim maximizing that number, it, it gives us an ability to negotiate a little more. Does that impact these are, are meaningful to somebody developing? Especially since last week we kind of set up some of that. Yeah. Dr. Yeah. Spears, do you have some? I have a few thoughts. Okay. <laughs> and those that don't know me, I'm John Spees, and I'm on planning and zoning, and I'm definitely not an expert on this, but I've looked into it a little bit. Uh, First thing I would say is get to know your legislators very well and spend some time with them in the next two years because the last two legislative sessions there's been more anti-city legislation than in the history of the state. And it's interesting because the state has filed more lawsuits against the federal government because the federal government's been getting into the state's business. And then more legislators are run on, we need to let locals do local than ever before, but then we've had more legislation anti-local government. And we need to fight back, and we do that with our votes and get to know the legislators. But that's my, my uh, politics for the evening. On this first bill that you're talking about, uh, First of all, I don't think the real answers are going to come out for a while.
while and it's going to be court cases that solve it. We can interpret all we want and say we think we can do this and we think we can do that. And you're going to see a lot of cities get into the gray area trying to protect their cities and get lawsuits filed against them and then we can find out what we really can do. And that's, that's the way legislations work forever and ever is you write this vague stuff out there and people try to interpret it and do it and then the courts decide how it actually comes out. Uh, I think the, a couple of the best solutions to what we have in front of us right now is a point system and to raise our impact fees as high as possible. I think y'all did talk about raising about half as far as you could. I think you go ahead and raise them all the way up as high as you can raise them. And then you say, okay, that's too high for you. Let's come down a couple of thousand dollars by if you agree to 80% brick. And let's come down another 20% by doing this until we're right back in line to where our impact fees, where you want them. If they do what we want, it's back down to the half where you're thinking about doing it. Uh, so I think that point system is going to be uh, very important. I think there's going to be some negative consequences for all homeowners. Uh, talk about affordable housing, I think they're making your house and my house more affordable to people by the opportunity for people to put junk next to it. I think you're going to see insurance rates go up because if you have a neighborhood with houses close to one another and somebody is able to put a house of pressed wood next to yours, it makes your house for a fire and they're not going to look at every house next to every house. I think it would just make insurance rates go up overall. Uh, but those are the things I think HOA, HOAs, the plan developments. Uh, but your question earlier, my thought process is if they come in and say, I'm going to put pressed wood in, the way our stuff is written right now, and I'm going to do an SF-60. And they check off all the boxes of the SF-60, except for they're going to do the press wood. I don't think you can turn it down, because they met all your requirements. If it's a planned development, you get into more negotiation back and forth, or, uh, you know, we, we can increase the we can, we've got control over the square footage. We've got control over roof pitch, which right now we don't address roof pitch. Uh, it's not the developers coming in you have to worry about. They're not going to put a Pepto-Bismol pink house. And they're not going to build cheap next to expensive. Right? They're going to build it out with the standard. Now, you are going to have... There's, there's a developer that's building here right now that, you know, well, most of the developers have their cheap homes. They, they got their different levels of homes, and they can come in and say, and they all need SF-60 or SF-84 or whatever. But, uh, and they can come in saying, oh, we're going to build this Taj Mahal. Well, as long as they're in that SF-60 or SF-84, they can come in and say, no, we changed your mind and we're, we're going to do all 60% masonry instead of 80%. Which right now our codes are 60%, but most of the builders are doing 80%. Well, that's because that's what I think people want. We've been discouraging the 60%. We were about to, in PNC, recommend to y'all raising the 60% to 80% and things like that. Uh, but those are my thoughts right now. But it's going to take several months to get this together. And in the meantime, this, this next part's going to control things too. And the developer that doesn't want to follow the rules 
getting around this next part. Unfortunately, we had 540 homes uh, the other day, so we maybe shut up. I don't think it's going to be the developers do these communities. It's going to be the one off. It's, yeah, it's going to be a the custom home that looks terrible and went to yeah. whatever. Anybody else have a vote? You know. Um, yes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I got several um, questions. Um, now, the HOA, I mean, that's okay, but that doesn't apply to a lot that's already zoned, it's already available. The, we can take it over the lot from that, correct? Um, we don't have to like you, though. <laughs> just to be clear. Yeah, just to be clear. <laughs> just so you know. Um, so, do you know how many suits have been filed from cities against the state in this stuff? I don't. None? Do we expect any? And if they do, wouldn't that address it quicker? I'll ask them. Well, yeah, I mean, if, if a city is a plaintiff in a lawsuit, then they're waiving that wage, their sovereign and governmental immunities. So when a city files a lawsuit, they open themselves up to whatever counterclaims the other party wants to bring against them. So um, I'm not sure what the claim would be against the state. It was a legislative act, and they've got the discretion to do what they want, you'd have to have some ground that it was unconstitutional or you know, class action? some other reason that it's... Get, get together, class action? I don't know. I don't, I'm not involved Probably not. I, I think the reality is, is some, some city, hopefully none that I represent, will get picked as a test case by a developer. Um, for pushing the line, and then we'll um, get some some which, more clarity. Yeah, which which brings me to my next point is we just is the council and zoning just approved development over by Bronze, the single VSO, single family small homes that they didn't. As I understand, they didn't have a builder set for that. Yeah, is that correct? They, when they had the BD, when they sent the BD? No, they I don't think they did at the time. I don't think they had it over. They didn't have it. They just had a rendering and kind of right. what it would look yeah. like and how many homes and what the. That's uh, what I was thinking. But. The parents look like. So that brings me to my question. They don't. Do they have to follow this now? That's correct. That's correct. They don't have to follow it? That is correct. They do not have to follow it. Yeah, they can go in and build now whatever. They can build. Homes they want. Yes, like BD. That was a BD. It was a BD. They they have to follow lot sizes, minimum square footage. But as far as construction material, they don't have to follow. But typically, the council, and it's a step that Julie and I just talked about, does not ever see a rendering of what's going to be built. Yeah, right. But that particular one, if I remember correctly, is plan development. Right. And like. They were wanting to do it is the town home mostly followed the city specs and they agreed to like the city the city code or the city ordinances called for a I think one enclosed garage. They they agreed to do, they agreed to go from sixty percent mainstream to eighty percent mainstream. And there were several other things. So they small, to they wanted to go they smaller, to but we still required them to have oh, that more small have to in the place. Just don't like but saying what we're saying now is even though we required this, they said they were going to go to 80% masonry, they can come back now and go to that 40% masonry right now. Right. But they still have to follow the Even though we agreed to the 80, there's, no, there's nothing keeping them now from a builder coming in there and building it. You know, as long as they, like what Julie was saying, follow. The lot size, you know, and everything else that we need. Anything that's in the material, they yeah. still follow. But this also gives us opportunity if we need to read a lot of our impact things like we had talked about our city. Yes, and just. just. <laughs> 
for the for the city's protection, I'd like to say each one will be evaluated on a case by case basis, and if there's a lawful way to enforce something, um, you would certainly exercise that right. So I wouldn't want anyone to interpret as saying it can't be enforced. That that's a global statement that would be true for every property owner. Yeah, so this isn't going to change what we're doing that much. It'll save us from putting the masonry on the train track side and probably the back side. But I just wanted to come tell you guys that first so we can all get on the same sheet of music. We wanted masonry columns and the masonry wainscot in the front with Harden that we could kind of refresh over the years. But it's not going to change much about what we're going to do. We, we just wanted to hear how much we can change the masonry without pissing everybody off that we have an agreement with. That's the main thing. But second off, I'll tell you from my and Steve's past experience, I would go real slow and let somebody else do the testimony on this because if somebody thinks they can get away with something, they're going to do it. And they're going to build some shoddy crap just so you'll say something and they're going to drop a lawsuit on it. And that's let somebody else be the test pilot on that lawsuit. It's taking money out of our pockets because we want all the houses we can have come here. I wouldn't build another house for two years. Because and I told I told everybody that, that I saw this, I'm like, I guarantee this is gonna get changed. The next legislation, it's gone. It's out of here. If you can hold on for that long, you probably can't. But if somebody thinks they can do something stupid, they're gonna do it. Well, right now we can try to build a but the things that we talked about the app, which is raising the impact fee, right. the development fees, that will change a lot of that. And especially if we We'll have to see. We'll, we'll have to discuss this some more. But at least now we're not sitting here in the dark saying, well, we can't do that. No, we can at least have a little bit of options. It's not all as lost. It's the little guys like us that want to come in those impact fees. I want to be honest with you, and we knew it going into it. The city doesn't offer us much when we're coming in to build something. We get like more burdens than anything. We're probably land and plans and tests, we're worth $100,000 into this. We haven't turned the first scoop of dirt yet. So, and then we still have to get the utilities and public works can't do it. Uh, so, I mean, probably a big, yeah, probably a big developer gets more out of the impact fees than we do, but we're not getting anything. So, that's where, that's where we have the spent program like Dr. Steve is talking about and Lane was talking about, but we go, like there's no regulations around that, so like we can literally go to you and go, hey, you're gonna build 80% masonry like what our ordinance was. You can pay this impact fee. But if we're gonna go to a big developer that they're gonna come in and they're known for building houses that are subpar, they're no. gonna go. We're gonna try to do the maximum the impact fee. Yeah. If you increase your masonry by 20%, then we'll let you, you know, use some different materials on the house that isn't gonna be masonry or as much percentage. We have to be careful on how that's presented because that. If, yeah, so if, if, if I may, I think the point is we need to look at a system to help manage us during this process. What that is has yet to be determined. I've talked to John about it. I've talked uh, to our city attorney about it. We'll come up with some method to do it. And I personally would just caution any further discussion on that. Well, and I know you're saying you have to be careful on it, but if and in my mind when I'm processing this, if the state's going to take it out of our hands to determine, you know, what the town wants and what we want it to look like on our development and safety of our town and all that, then who cares? Well, we don't have to worry about that. Like, we can now get to a point, and again, outside, not in the gray area, but in a real area, to where we can help still try to shape what the developers are going to look like coming in, what they're going to build. But I don't think you have to worry about it because, again, if we just point it back to the state legislation of they tie our hands. Once we have an opportunity to look at what some other cities are coming up with, we can maybe have a little more here. Yeah, I think that with Prosper and Frisco, I think they're going to come up with some quick solutions that might be challenged in court. But I think we need to be watching their community newsletters because I, I think they're the ones that have a lot to lose that are. Plus, they have enough money to file a lawsuit. Yes. Well, big developers have money to file a lawsuit against them. 
impact fees, how are the impact fees right now? Is it just a set fee for every tap? Or is it based on square footage? I can't remember. Our, our current water fees are $2,200 for water, $1,100 for sewer. And that has nothing to do with building anything. It has nothing to do with this project. Right. An impact fee is paid to support the infrastructure in the city, not so, that particular part. Right, so it doesn't matter what size of building it is, it's 2200 It does not matter. The size, the size, the size of the, of the, yeah, the, the size yeah. of the cap goes up according to the amount of water consumed. So if you have a three quarter inch meter, which is the smallest one we sell, it's one fee. It goes up, what, five times if it's? It's uh, two, and a half, two, two and a half times for one inch and five times for an inch and a half. Yeah. There's a, so there's you know, a the, the meter fee goes up according to the size that's installed. Well, we, just, we get a community development fee. Well, we're, yeah, that's being presented on the 10th as a community development fee. Yeah. Is that where we might look at? That, yeah, that's to support the park system, but that's a negotiable, it's a permit fee. Yeah. It's a negotiable permit fee. Yeah, we've got multiple ideas on ways to be creative. A couple of them I talked about with the P&Z. I think it was the July meeting. The, the point system he mentioned was um, one of them. You'll see an example of it at your next meeting when the look at the PD ordinance that will be in your packet for the zoning on Project Green. Um, I've put some language in there that hopefully makes what they've represented for masonry and their elevations to be enforceable for and you could do this in other pds for example they want gravel display areas so if you do this masonry you can have gravel display area or at the owner's option if you don't want to do masonry you can have concrete and comply with the other standards that we can enforce and so then it gives them a choice and if they want the gravel they have to do the masonry so there I mean, with each case we'll try to think of language or ways to help uh, yeah, 40, yeah. Mm -hmm. well this is mainly to get everybody acquainted with what the regulations are now and It's a property tax incentive. So they you would still it. pay 100% of the property tax, and then the city would reimburse you. Yeah. Because I see people trying to do the end around. Yeah. Uh, yeah. We're going to maintain control of the money. Well, yeah. anyway. Money speaks louder. It's it's easier, it's <laughs> right. uh, so we're going to leave on this note. What about, because it kind of comes back to our point here, what if you did require a rendering before you approve something, just like ours? You know, if we came in, so we want to build this story, we want to permit, take a look at it, and could you look at it and go, no, we're not going to approve that. But well, that wouldn't stop anybody from showing this one thing and still doing the other, so it really wouldn't matter. Yeah, that's true. They could show well, the same thing they want. Well, and you're, you're going to steer away a lot of business doing that because mm -hmm. they're... You're, you're going to have to... You also have to look, you have to look at your perspective. You take his 60 foot, I just did the math real quick. You take a 60 by 8 foot building, 8 foot high, and you want, because you'll probably have a 10 foot plate line, if you say 80% masonry on the building, you're looking at 
seven hundred something thousand dollars for brick. Whereas you, they say they, they're going to put a hardy on the building. You're looking at set, you're looking at five hundred seventy six thousand dollars for hardy. Okay, that eleven hundred dollar impact fee. Yeah, I'll, I'll pay the extra thousand dollars. I'll pay that because I'm saving twenty thousand dollars. Yeah, but you have to look at the total picture, mm -hmm. not just impact fees. Correct. Yes. So there's it, it's got to be several things that it could be negotiated if that particular facility is critical. You may yeah. not want to do it if it's not, but if it's critical, you have to find other ways. Okay. And for me, I'm I'm with John. I'm just trying to get from here to the next legislative <laughs> session. <laughs> All right. But that All right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Want to go on to the next house bill? Yes. Oh, you have a question? Just one. one. Oh. Oh, sorry. Yes, sorry. Please don't shoot the messenger. <laughs> um, so 3167 is what's being called as the shot clock bill. Um, as you know, it's before this bill was passed, plats had to be acted on within 30 days of being filed by the PNZ and then by the council within 30 days of the PNZ action and if they weren't they were deemed approved. However, most cities had a process in place where it gave the engineers for the city time to review and comment and give those comments back to the applicant and then the applicant could correct the comments and get it turned back in and get it right before it comes to the PNZ and then comes to you. Um, this shot clock bill, it's still 30 days, but it has greatly tightened up the procedures and it has added more than just plats. That rule, the rule will now apply to plats and plans and plans has a definition in the bill, but it's a lot of other undefined terms, construction plans, engineering plans, site plans, etc. So now the civil construction documents, all of that have to be, that are normally administratively approved, those um, don't typically come before PNZ and Council, those also have to be approved within 30 days or acted on, I guess, um, or they're going to be considered approved. Um, the three choices are to approve something, approve it with conditions, or deny it. If you deny something, you have to give a list to the owner of every reason that you're denying it, and then every reason on the list has to have a reference to the section of your code of ordinances that requires that particular element. Um, so really the list, if the recommendation is going to be to deny, then that list should really be in the packet or presented to the PNZ or you all at the meeting so that the list can be included as part of the motion. You're no longer going to have the ability to table to get more information. Um, because the clock will be ticking and the 30 days is going to run before your next meeting. If you, um, if you deny, then the applicant can have the opportunity to correct everything that was on the list that you said was wrong. They can take as long as they want. They, they can take two years if they want to. But once they give it back in with the corrections, the city has 15 days to approve, approve with the conditions, or deny, or it will be deemed approved. So there's potential that that 15-day period won't be a 15-day period where you have a PNG or a council meeting. If they have if they've changed things in order to bring their plan into compliance with the comments that you gave and now something else is wrong, the act reads as you cannot give any additional comments other than what you gave the first time when they resubmit. 
even if your standards Did change. Did you say that was on a denial but or? That's on a denial. denial. What so about the conditions side of it? If you approve with conditions, then you've acted within the time frame and it's approved, but they can't move forward unless they meet the conditions that were. But then they have to bring that back to us and they have to approve. It doesn't have to come back before you and PNZ. It can just um, be and staff. You, and you said that's 30 days from when it lands on PNC's uh, yeah. when, when it's submitted. When it's submitted. And we cannot dictate what day we will take those submissions. We can't say we only take them on the 23rd to meet our current schedule so it gets to PNZ and it gets to you within that window of time. We have to take them the day they're handed to us and that starts the clock. And some cities are going to try that. Some, um, and hopefully, well, I think hopefully they get sued it. over it and they win and then we can all do it. <laughs> um, but <laughs> I think we got to play. <laughs> That's what they're saying is prepare for more meetings. Yeah, if in the middle of a session, say two weeks in, that's going to really mess up. That's not enough time to prepare to get it to P and Z for the new look at. Right. And there's going to be some developers that know that timeline and know when your meetings are. And I don't want them to look at it real carefully, so I'm going to push that deadline to where they don't have time to look at it. Um, and the reality is, if, if assuming you can have the meetings on time, I don't think this helps developers any more than it helps cities because it puts historically, if something is not ready to be approved, the city will work with the developer to get it ready and then get it approved. We're not going to have the luxury to work with them anymore and if it's not ready you're going to have no choice but to put it on for denial. They can have one more bite at the apple to turn it back in and then you have your 15 day window but if it gets denied then, then my interpretation of it is they have to start over with a new application. And that means a new application fee, et cetera, et cetera. And it doesn't save them any time. And some property owners that use outside engineering firms and consultants, I mean, the city, you know, Lynn could work really hard to get them comments within 10 days and you've got 20 days left. And in that 20 days, you don't hear back from the owner's engineer. The owner may not even realize their engineer hasn't responded to the comments and you're forced to put it on for denial because Lynn hasn't gotten anything back with everything corrected that he told or, them was wrong. Or, God forbid our engineer is in a traffic accident or sick. <laughs> but, or goes he, on vacation. Yeah. but in that case, <laughs> just <to> Europe, yeah. <laughs> but in that case, if you put it on for denial, you can get the comment in there why we did it, right? The comment there should be a list in your packet of but why. But that list would be denied. like we didn't get anything back from the engineers on the other side, whatever it is. Well, it would have everything, like everything Lynn would have said needed to be fixed. But then they would have 15 days to respond after that with or meet the demand. After you deny it, they have as long as they want oh, to right. respond. So they may actually send it back in. So this was 15 a days solution to the problems that didn't exist. Well, and there's a cost associated with all this. You can't move this much paper with these critical timelines without staff to get it done. I mean, it's going to drive the need for more people at City Hall. I mean, have to have a planner. This has now become a big, big job. Um, and, you know, here we go. It, it's, this is a real challenge. I have the same question that Jennifer mentioned. If we denied it and had the list and then they have said they can take two years, what if your standards do change, you know, if, as long as the law allows, but can we then, does it have to be No, it, it would be the, the standards from when they initially applied. So if, no matter how many years, I mean, it's one of those big things, I guess. 
Did you did you answer? Yes. No, I, I didn't answer. Oh. She's still, she's still <laughs> Some things I don't like to say in public. All right. <laughs> I was waiting for the <laughs> So okay, next next slide. I think you you've gotten your the, the gist. Yes, I I took the tea that that one is the process and procedures that you set up and we need to change our procedures for what it takes to turn in their information in the first place. You know, if, the if, if, if you have a requirement to meet with city staff before you turn it in, it is a requirement. Uh, then your you city staff has put their eyes on it and made their comments, and so when they turn it in for the 30 days, then, then it would be Well, and another option is just if you don't have time to give the comments back and go back and forth, you don't just create your list and get it on an agenda and deny it and with the list of why and they'll learn. Yeah. But, yeah. To, to go, but to go with what he said, though, in your application process, can you have things like that would normally happen Within you know meeting with engineer and all that stuff, doing the impact studies and all that stuff, would that, have, would that wouldn't have to be done up front, or could you make it requirement? Well, the slide? so we'll we're actually going to touch on that on this slide. Okay. Um, it it can be done up front, but there's there's no way to force the applicant to do a, like a pre submittal review or go through a comment before they file their application if they don't want to. If they want to push the strict 30 day rule upon the city, then they can. The statute does allow the cities to adopt alternative procedures if they're faster. Um, so the recommendation on that is the alternative procedure would be to do a pre-submittal review process where they don't file their application until after the comments back and forth have already happened. And then the city gives like a certificate of completeness or whatever you want to call it that says you've addressed all our comments and we think your application is in good order and should be recommended for approval then they could file, and the way we're going to say it's faster is if you file with a certificate of completeness, you're on the very next agenda. There's no way for it to be any faster than that. Um, and so I'm, I'm actually working on a development application right now that will have both options on it, and the applicant gets to check the box, which which one do they want? Um, and the city cannot ask them or require them to waive the 30-day requirement. But I think you could certainly have a notice on the application that says the city cannot ask or require you to waive the 30-day option, so pick whichever one you want. However, the law doesn't prohibit you from asking the city to give you a 30-day waiver. That's what the law says. However, the way this is worded, if they say I want a 30-day waiver, technically the 30-day waiver is supposed to be granted by the governing body, which is not staff. So then there's a question of does even that have to come before you? Because some cities are going to try a one-day-a-week filing. Um, I, I think a lot of them will get away with it just because honestly that makes it easier for the developer if they know you file, you know, we take filings every Monday, you file on Monday, this is the schedule, this is the PNZ meeting you'll be on, this is the council meeting you'll be on, but that's going to have to be your alternate procedure. All right, next question. Um, more some things cannot be approved by staff, such as plats. The law says they have to come. They don't have to come to council, but they do have to go to PNZ at a at a minimum. And then they can go to the council. That depends on what your ordinances say, and um, your ordinances have both. I think when something is being 
deny, in the motion to deny, there should be no move to deny for all the reasons listed in the agenda packet and delegate authority for staff to approve their resubmittal if everything is corrected. So that then you're delegating the ability to approve during that 15 day window. And it doesn't have to get to PNC to and council PNC again. Mm -hmm. All right, next. So, yeah, any questions on that one? Oh, I have like an eight page summary for you, Len. <laughs> <I know. laughs> Sorry. Okay, currently, only flats and site plans go before PNZ for final action. And then they appear on the council's agenda. The civil drawings, the design drawings are all at the discretion of the city manager or his appointee. Yes. So now, those have to be accompanying the site plan and plats? No, but they do have to be approved, approved with conditions or denied within 30 days okay. by staff. Okay. But because they've never, those plans have never appeared on the agenda. Right, and they, they still don't have to, but the time frame okay. still applies to them all. Site plans under the zoning ordinance, um, are not subject to these rules. It, things under the zoning ordinance still can have the time frame set forth in the zoning ordinance. This only applies to subdivision ordinance type things, plats, construction plans, etc. So if a site plan is like technical plan for construction, the rule applies. If a site plan is part of a zoning case to show this is where the uses are going to be, then this bill does not apply to that. And one more, this one's really short, there's only one slide for this bill. Um, the state legislature has added to the list of who has the authority to file in court to appeal a decision of the Board of Adjustments. So as an example, if someone apply to the Board of Adjustments to get a side yard setback variance. Say the setback on their lot is supposed to be seven feet under the zoning ordinance and they ask for this, the side yard setback to be reduced to five feet. Under the old law, after the BOA makes its decision, the only parties that could appeal that decision to court was either the city or the property owner. But now, any property owner within 200 feet of the affected property also has the ability to appeal. So if the BOA granted the variance and the neighbor did not like the idea of a structure being two feet closer than it would have been, then that neighbor can appeal to court to try to get the BOA's decision overruled. So it doesn't really change the notice procedures as folks already get notice that are within the 200 feet. It doesn't change how the BOA will make its decisions. It just adds to whom can appeal to court. Continue taking the action necessary regarding an ordinance, amending the zoning ordinance, subdivision regulation ordinance, and building codes to cause said ordinances to be compliant with House Bill 2439, House Bill 3167, and House Bill 2497, which bills take effect on September 1st, 2019. I strongly recommend it for you all. We can have a choice of who's going to introduce the motion. I'll introduce the motion. I have no problem doing that. Because it clearly says that we can amend it upon further amendments to the state and everything else. So I'm making a motion to do I have to make something specific. 
motion to approve. Or just a motion to approve the city ordinance regarding the three new hospitals as written. That works. I have a motion and a second. Second. I have a motion and a second. And, and like Mr. Collins said, we will probably be amending that bill for now too. We, we know this is a temporary gap. We're just working on a control. All in favor, raise your right hand. This time, <coughs> and the question is chapter 551 of the Texas Government Code on the Meetings Law. The city uh, may be in a closed executive session pursuant to applicable laws. Uh, all I would the executive session is pursuant to the following delineated section of the Texas Government Code annotated, subchapter 551. The council will enter into the executive session to discuss the following items A, section 551.087. Economic development negotiations regarding one project green and two uh,